Hello everyone and welcome back to the Straight Chilling Podcast. Today I have a very special episode. I am here in Buchan, South Korea at the Bifon Festival. I am with a very special guest. So welcome Damien McCarthy. Thank you for sitting down with me, Damien. Thank you very much. <laughs> so Damien, you have a brand new film that is playing here at the festival. It's been playing, um, the, it's been going through the festival circuit and it's coming out in theaters uh, July 19th in the US and eventually will be coming to Shudder. That movie is called Oddity. Could you tell us just a little bit about it up front? Sure, so Oddity is my second feature film uh, following Caveat. And it's a, I like to think of it as like a supernatural revenge movie. Yeah. Um, with a little bit of, a little bit of everything. It's lots of sub-genres of horror. Uh, you get your psychological, your supernatural, a bit of a slasher element to it. Yeah. So hopefully there's a little bit of something for everybody there. Yeah. So one of the things, um, before we get into Oddity specific, I was just kind of like curious, since this is your second film and both of them are horror films, I was kind of just curious about what kind of resonates for you or it's just fun about creating films within the horror genre I guess it starts with just a love of the genre I do just mm. l love horror films uh, always have my parents had a a, a, a VCR a, a video rental store okay, when I was growing cool. up so <laughs> yeah so as like a, a 10 year old I was always wandering around inside there just usually in the horror section mm -hmm. just looking at the old um, artwork on the, the VHS cases um, and it was just a, a lifelong love of horror, really. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and just that's kind of how it started, I guess. Cool. Yeah. So, like, is in creating horror films like today, do you feel like there's like a bit of that childhood like baked into there? Like you're kind of fulfilling this, um, it's some of the excitement you got from, from back then? I think it is. I think it's still there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, uh, I guess the thing I like about it is that you know if it's working as well, because mm. it's a little bit like comedy, you know, if you're sitting in an audience Fine. and there's no reaction at all. I think you could sit inside a drama and things could be, the audience could be very, very quiet and the film could be working perfectly. But if it's a comedy and the audience are very quiet or if it's a, a horror movie and it's quiet, it's hard to, you, 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 something's gone wrong so, somewhere, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, so that's probably why it's just that fine line between horror and comedy that... You, yeah, you know, you're, you know, you know, you're getting a reaction straight away, and sometimes we see a lot of crossover in that way with horror comedies, but even sometimes comedians coming into horror because it is a lot about like timing and pacing and and setting things up, and that's actually perfectly goes into the, kind of the next thing I want to talk to you about because. All of your stuff that I've seen, because the two films, and then I also saw a short that you did back in 2010 that was called "He Dies at the End." Oh yeah, and. You set up tension so well. Just your movies are very tense in a very natural way. There's there's an art to it, and um, and along with that goes like you set up your jump scares really well. But just even separate from the jump scares, there's always this like really natural tension that exists in all of the work of yours that I've seen. So how do you go about creating such a natural tension in that kind of way? How do you, how do you think about scenes like that? I guess it's just the suspense. It's almost like the jump scare is just to put a tag at the end of it. It's just, sure, it's yeah. over. So, um, but really it's just, just about building that, that building that atmosphere and that tension. I think there's, the way I've, I have thought about this a bit in that there's a bit of like weaponizing an, an audience, what they know about horror films against them. Yeah. You know, I think like, I, I, know, where, I know where this scare is going. It's, it's, it's going to be here. We're, mm. we're so obviously building to this. Um, so it's trying to write something that, you, that, that seems like it's going to be predictable and then trying to find a way to kind of write yourself out of that corner and go, well, you think it's happening this way, but instead we're going to, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we're going to uh, take this sudden turn and, and try to catch you out. 
ca catch on in, in a different way. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's one of the things as a viewer who watches a lot of horror movies and stuff like that really stands out and shines because if it does feel like there's a lot of thought put into it because there is a, a bit of a rhythm and um, you know, decades worth of examples to kind of build to that. So it's always nice when something like catches you off guard or gets you and you're like, you know, you kind of get that jump moment and then kind of laugh at yourself and yeah. say like, oh, it got me. You know, it's it's like riding a roller coaster. So it's a lot of fun. Um, not to be too spoilery with this film, but there was a moment in this film, actually, I guess kind of a two part question. Hmm. There was a moment in this film where there was a very obvious reference to caveat that I was like super excited about. I was like, oh, and, um, but there's also just a lot of interesting items um, in the film, um, in the kind of uh, antique shop. Mm. Um, and I love how that you set that up, but was there any particular inspiration for some of these items or where did you get the kind of inspiration for this, this shop? I guess it's just an old horror trope of, of, of a collection of haunted items. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's around a long time. Um, when it came to the back of her shop and showing all these selected items, some of them are just selected almost for comedy that they don't, they don't look ha haunted or look like there'd be any story, backstory to them. Um, others then are very much just taken from short films I had made, I had made before. There's the, um, I made a film called Hatch about a guy who lays an egg. The egg is there on the shelf. Oh. There's a, a uh, film I made called Hungry Hickory with a tape recorder, that's there. Um, the Some of the items from the desk and he dies at the end that you mentioned, they're there. Um, it's just that he's just an odd collection of stuff to just okay. to, um, I guess, just, just to try to get the audience imagination going. Like, I wonder how, how was that haunted? Yeah. We know that with the desk bell, she says that, well, this desk bell is haunted. If you ring that, a bellboy appears. Yeah. But what happens if you turn on the radio? Or what happens if you, you know, uh, there's a camera there. What happens if you take a picture of it? Uh, and of course, amongst all that, I think there is a little nod to, to caveat in that it's the original bunny for caveat is, is gone. I don't have it anymore. Oh no! Yeah, but the um, the the designer she had she just has this wonderful aesthetic in this in the in 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 the items that mm. she makes. So she made us like a not exactly a bunny, but kind of a big hair with mm. with, with with symbols, kind of a bigger, meaner version of it. Um, again, I just wanted some some piece of her art in there somewhere and said, oh, perfect. It's a way to have a little nod to, to, to caveat yeah. uh, and also get to get, get to work with her again. Yeah, as a viewer, it was really just fun for me. Um, mm -hmm. But also, I, I guess the second part of my question, which you kind of answered a little bit, I was curious if there was any um, intentional connection other than mm -hmm. just like something fun for the audience. Was there anything you were trying to tie into caveat at all or was it more just a wink at the camera? Just a wink, just, yeah. just, just a wink at the camera. I, I think uh, so many films are, uh, I find that going out of their way to connect everything and <laughs> that, that's a call back to something and I'm, I'm obviously guilty of it too because I have a little nod to it. Um, it's just supposed to be a very subtle thing. I, I remember uh, Quentin Tarantino, he talked about how loose, very loose connections between his movies, which mm. I liked, like having uh, uh, characters sh share the same surname, like, you know, Reservoir Dogs mm. and uh, Pulp Fiction, there's the Vega Brothers, mm. you know, and it's, yeah. it's, if you don't notice it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't do anything to your viewing of the film, but if you notice, it's like, oh, that's, yeah. that's kind of interesting <laughs> as a little passing Easter egg. Same thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just a little, a little nod to it is nice. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's, it's fun for the viewers, like, who get to catch on to it, but yeah, yeah. It, it did make, okay, well, yeah, that's, it was fun to know. Um, and speaking of the items, one thing that was really cool about this film, too, is we have a lot of vampires, zombies, and this one has the supernatural element to it, um, with some ghost elements but one of the intriguing things was it's kind of a golem movie mm. which yeah. is a subgenre that just is not explored often and so i was really excited to have this really quality film occupy this current space in that subgenre that just doesn't get a lot of attention or love so uh, what was kind of the inspiration for that and how'd you get the idea to to kind of do this golem movie the golem is yeah it's a good it, it is a, it's a it's a good reference to it i i i think it had started with the idea of almost doing like a a haunt the haunted doll the, mm. the annabelle chucky um uh talking tina from the twilight zone um i think maybe the very original idea was something like that but she's some kind of a haunted doll you mm. know but it 
uh, just how scary would that have been with this thing chasing people? And it's been done a lot too. It's mm. just sort of like a more imposing, bigger f- figure that she brings to the house with her in that kind of golem. Uh, you know, threatening presence, mm-hmm. especially when it sat there for the whole movie at the table. Um, that's kind of where it start. That's r- really where the idea started. Is just mm. you know something that that will be imposing yeah. as a centerpiece in the film. I love the design. Did you um, did was it the same designer that was creating the items like in the shop? And and did you have a lot of input into how it looked or like what was that process like? So it, it, it was difficult because what <laughs> happened was we had. Um, just through one thing and another, we'd really run out of time w- w- to, do, to do the special effects in it. And there's a, a very talented designer in Ireland called P- Paul McDonnell. Mm-hmm. And I basically pitched the idea to Paul and said, like, uh, we'd need this built. Mm-hmm. And it would, be, uh, it would be two things. It would be a prop sitting at the table, which doesn't move. But then it would be an exact replica of that mm-hmm. uh, for a stunt, a, st- stunt, a stunt performer to, to wear when he comes to life and moves around. And uh, we had like four or five weeks to do this, so it was pretty much um, it was pretty much just 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 designing it live on Zoom with Paul. I was down in Cork, and Paul was up in Galway, mm-hmm. and uh, he just starts molding it on screen. And we and I had drawings and stuff like this that I had that I had made of it, and uh, we basically just had to do kind of like a, a couple of hours on Zoom, mm-hmm. this one live one live. Uh, um, creation of it and then it had to be molded and uh, and put together very very fast so it, but it was all down to Paul's talent and patience that we got it I mean with the design of it it was always important that he was screaming yeah. it always looked like something that was tortured or, <laughs> yeah. or in pain as opposed to looking more frightening I always kind of wanted him to look like he was just in agony and the reason for that is just when you got to the end of the film I knew that, that the sound design was really going to gonna mm. take over I mean sound design is just so important in horror films anyway if it's you know, I, I I I always think that if a film is scaring you, don't uh, you know, don't don't cover your eyes, cover your ears. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, it's just not scary anymore. Um, so the idea of designing him with this this kind of pained look on his face mm-hmm. would be that when you do get to that third act, it really just allowed um, for sound design to really create something, uh, you know, really unsettling and uh, and just leave it wide open for anything we want to do once we got to that third act. So yeah, that was that, that was really important. Yeah. Thinking of sound design as we were, you know, working on the visuals of it. Yeah, I think it really paid off. It was um, there's a lot of great, as you said before, there's a lot of great elements to this film, and it, a bit of a hodgepodge that just like blends really well, though. But that's definitely uh, d- definitely one of the standouts and something that makes this film unique. I think in that way. So yeah, just off camera, I was mentioning that the guys got a chance to um, to go to Overlook, and that was a big talk of the town. Even I was uh, meeting with a director here earlier in um, in Korea, and he was at Overlook too, and that he mentioned it. Oh. <laughs> he mentioned it's it, awesome. so uh, it's, it's generating a lot of talk. So I think that that's going to be kind of one of those iconic horror monsters for 2024. I think it's very unique and I really enjoyed seeing it and again it kind of fills this interesting subgenre that we don't that we don't get a lot of. Uh, but another interesting element of the film was the location. Beautiful location. Um, so I was uh, curious if you could talk a little bit about that location, how you found it and um, just uh, what it was like to shoot there. So we shot it in Bantry House in West Cork it's this large, um, large estate in uh, in Bantry, okay. in the southwest of Ireland, and I had at, at that room essentially is is, a, is an old converted stables that was turned into an exhibition center in the nineties, okay. and it's been closed. They don't do anything with it anymore. Uh, it, it exists the way it is. The way we shot it is 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 what it looks like, without, without obviously furniture and things like this. But I'm friends with the family that own the that own the property, so when I made caveat. It was in that room where I built all my sets. Really? So Olga's bedroom, the corridor, all that stuff. It's all in that one room. Uh, but I, And I spent so much time in there and I said, well, the, the room itself is actually really cool. If you, It wouldn't have suited Caveat, obviously, because Caveat was supposed to be this run-down mm-hmm. house on an island. Mm-hmm. But when I looked at the actual room itself, I said, well, the room's really interesting because you've got this um, large stone pillar with a stairs that curls around it so you can't see... You know, there's lots of corners wow. here. There's lots of long walkways and, you know, balconies overhead. Um, so just the more I thought of the location, I said, well, if I actually wrote Oddity for this location, mm-hmm. it could be visually quite interesting because you're, you know, 
it would be that challenge of like the film could feel claustrophobic but in terms of filming it's quite an odd space mm. and I just thought it would really suit the character of Ted as well um, so that was it it was basically just shooting where we shot Caveat without right. the sets and, and just you know writing around um, writing around what you have access to which is yeah. usually kind of a good rule for uh, low budget filmmaking is you know write around what you have that, mm -hmm. that other people maybe don't have access to that's right. Yeah, I, I didn't quite realize that it was the same space, but you did a fantastic job transforming it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do love both the spaces in Caveat and in Oddity. They, they do feel very different. But I guess that kind of naturally leads me into, I was curious, um, they, they feel similar, but they also feel very distinct. They have different themes going on and stuff. So was there anything, uh, was there any major changes in making the second film that you maybe learned or like you didn't want to do again for the first film or like what was it like going into making a second film? Uh, they're very different experiences. Again, with, with Caveat, we had, it was an, a no budget movie. So everything was, um, begged borrowed or stolen <laughs> you know uh it was lots of friends and family helping to make it uh you know our, our crew was tiny we had two on camera two on sound uh one production designer you know this kind of thing whereas oddity was very much teams of people we had a, a production designer and uh, she had a team and a cinematographer and he had a team and you know it, it, costume um it all just makes a difference. You can just, I mean, our crew were amazing. So you, you, you know, you get to, this is their talent. You yeah. get to go, well, I have these ideas of what I'd like to do. And then they, they can build on your ideas or they can give you completely different stuff. So for that, it's just uh, really made me appreciate co collaborating. Mm -hmm. If you've done it kind of all, all, your, all on your own, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with help from other people. But with this time, it just felt like a very, just a much more enjoyable experience as well of course it just felt like less less pressure because it's like mm. i don't have to i can direct the film i can yeah, just, yeah. just say let's go this way as opposed to it's just up to me to do it mm -hmm. you know less uh, burden in that less way, burden, yeah. yeah but I, th I think it's the only way you, it was either that or not or not you know yeah not get a film made sure. you either you put in all the hard work and do these things yourself or else yeah. you just don't get to do it i guess do what you gotta do yeah well was there any so speaking on that was there anything that somebody that you kind of had designed in your mind that you wanted to go some way but ultimately somebody kind of changed it and you thought oh like that's for the better or is there anything that sticks out in your mind for this I'd movie say for it probably every department oh really yeah I, I, you know <laughs> You'd love to say, no, my ideas are all, sure. all the best and, you know, um, I shot down all those bad ideas. No, it's like, uh, so let's see. So, for example, I'd look at Darcy and I'd look at that first shot of Darcy when she's inside in the, in, when you first meet her inside in her, um, her antique store. Mm -hmm. I mean, she looks like a little ballerina in, in a music box, mm -hmm. in an antique music box. And mm -hmm. that's very much comes into the costume and, uh, and uh, production design. Mm -hmm. um, stuff that I wouldn't really have thought of. You'd have an idea, you know, but, but then it's just the, the way these things can be, um, the way they can elaborate on it. Uh, the design of the house itself, Lauren Kelly, our production designer, had this great idea that, well, it, Ted's very much about his job. So it's almost like, what if his, what if even his house was an extension of this? That it was like this very leather and or leather and steel kind of masculine feel, yeah. almost as if the room itself feels like a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist's office. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's nothing very kind of, uh, it's for quite a clinical, a strange clinical room, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I think even Steve Wall's character. So Steve plays uh, Ivan, the, the, this this uh, uh, this bell, uh, 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 an orderly, mm -hmm. and he's very much like he was written to be very much like a henchman to Ted, and I wrote him really just as this kind of rough kind of character that's. Um, uh, he, there's he, not really like the way Steve played him. You know, I'd written him really as this kind of, kind of a, a bully, kind of thuggish uh, henchman, essentially, to Ted. But then the way Steve plays him, mm -hmm. he plays him much more quiet and sinister. And it's the same dialogue. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same on paper. Mm -hmm. But then what Steve did with him, it felt like he kind of weirdly idolized Ted, and even his 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 speech, the, the way he acts, is kind of like. Uh, kind of following Ted in this strange way and all that is really useful because one it's more interesting than what I came up with and two it, <laughs> it, it makes more sense in terms of the character because he's he's uh, it, it kind of lends itself to why he's doing all these things for Ted why he's why he's willing to kill for him and mm. 
and uh, because he idolizes him in some weird way. I could go on in every department. Oh, no. P people give you these things. You go like, I didn't think about that. that. That's brilliant. And that's, you know, I think that's just the nature of filmmaking anyway. It's very interesting. And it sounds very rewarding, too. If you've ever spent any time creating anything, knowing like what professionals bring to a table or just different perspectives bring to a table can just be so exciting because you get just as excited participating in it as then viewers do watching it when it's finished. So... Yeah, it's um, it's really fun to hear those those kind of stories. Um, I was curious because based on the kind of films that you've made, um, have you ever personally experienced anything supernatural? You have any fun supernatural stories? Do I? Um, <laughs> nothing that will be yeah. nothing that will be good in a film. You know, yeah. I remember um, I used to work as an electrician. It was a very old home in Cork City that I remember wiring, and I was there late one night. And the basement, so the, so the basement used to have these old, uh, there, there was a servant's tunnel mm. and it would, it would run from, it was steps down outside and it would run the full length of, of the, the basement. And you could see these windows that led into this old tunnel and it was pitch black inside there, like nobody got in there in, you know, 70, 70 years, whatever. Um, but for sure there, there was, there was a, just a really weird feeling. Mm. And I remember being inside there one night and uh, I was just finishing up. I was getting my toolbox and getting my tools and starting to, uh, to leave. And I could just heard somebody just run down the tunnel. Mm. Uh, but like it's, there's no access to it. You know, it's all closed up and there was definitely nobody in there because it was a, a gated area. So that, that was, you know, I mean, yeah. could, I mean obviously it could have just been, it could have been somebody just, just running down there, you yeah. know. But, uh, but again, how they got in there or even the fact that there was somebody I I even in there. Yeah. You know? But I guess that's the closest I've come to something. Uh, something spooky. You know? Oh, that's. I was fun. out of there anyway. Yeah. You know, I, was, I didn't find. I didn't stay with her. Stay to check if it was a ghost or just. Uh, <laughs> no, that is exciting. I've always like wanted that kind of experience. I maybe had something when I was younger, but I'm always like I was like a kid or whatever. But mm. um, I, it's, I used to work as an electrician as well, and actually, oh. um, one of the other hosts, uh, Rob, he he's an electrician, so that's very oh, well. interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, you ever got shocked? Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> explains a lot. I think <laughs> exactly. Um, well, kind of off of that too, but coming back to oddity a little bit, um, the sister that you mentioned of Darcy is really interesting and played very well. But I was curious of in creating this kind of story. Uh, do you kind of believe in the idea of this? Uh, this twin telekinesis this kind of connections that twins have have you ever spoken with anybody about it or experienced anything in that way i never spoken to anybody uh, never spoken to anybody about it but just reading about it online you hear mm. that there is a, a connection there that's mm. um that's uh you know i don't know how you'd explain it yeah. they always see that they're say they're very much in sync and mm -hmm. um I guess from just a narrative point of view it was just for me it was just a way to connect to to, to make to give the the characters that uh a quick connection that the audience would understand. Mm. Um, I mean, they could have just been friends, they could have been uh, siblings, but to have them tw twins, I just mm. thought it would be a kind of a, a, a quick, easy way to, 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 to build that bond with them, especially mm. when they don't even share any, any scenes together, any yeah. screen time. But then people seem to buy that, yeah, they can imagine these two characters were very close. Yeah, and I liked, I just liked the design of both of them separately because they are so distinct. Um, but I like just like some of those little choices and I think that's really caught my attention of speaking earlier about your, your ability to kind of create this natural tension of just that she's blind, um, which is just a very interesting choice. And so she feels maybe less threatening when she comes into the house and mm. things like that. And so there was a, a lot of nice uh, little subtle touches there that I really enjoyed. It's funny because I, I sometimes, when I watch the film now, and I sometimes wonder if it's something that I should have, you'd always have these things when you finish the film, and I wonder, should I push this a little further? Is that when she does arrive at the house, and you're saying that, uh, you know, that maybe there's a bit more of a vulnerability to her, that maybe she doesn't, see, doesn't seem as much of a threat, um, I sometimes kind of wonder if audience would ever look at it and go like, I wonder, is she up to something, or is she actually going to be the villain? Because her, her behavior, her kind of odd, um, the, the way she is when she arrives at the house, mm -hmm. It's like, oh, she's up to something. There's something off about her here. And I wonder if, if that's something that could have been played up more for, um, 
more for horror. To be like that film, did you ever see Don't Look Now? Mm, Donald yeah, Sutherland. sure. Mm -hmm. It's like I always thought the scariest thing of that was that that blind psychic in it because she's so uh, intense mm -hmm. and uh, yet she's the hero of the film. She's <laughs> yeah. just trying to save him. But uh, uh, it's a little bit of that, that kind mm -hmm. of vibe I think I was tr trying to capture. Yeah. I think you did really well and I think ultimately once the film is done and you have this character that she kind of now lives in horror, I think it's it's nice to have because it, it, she's she's powerful in a different kind of way or mm. whatever, just kind of the, the way she like approaches things. So I just really enjoyed that character and thought she was written really well and liked following her Thank you. as well. So this is your first time in Korea and at Bifan. Is there anything you're particularly excited about trying or doing while you're here? It's just to, it's my first time here, yeah. It's yeah. just to try to s uh, enjoy the festival, mm. soak up the culture. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan of Korean cinema, obviously, so mm. it's just, um, yeah just just try to enjoy it i guess yeah yeah have fun while you're here it's a really fun festival it's going to be wrapping up soon but um there's still a lot of great events happening and then once you get into seoul there's like i'm i'm just uh always like uh constantly like building up like uh, come to seoul come visit me in seoul to everyone i can speak to so I, I know you're gonna have a good time and i'm excited for you to experience it um there is one thing that we like to do when we do all of our interviews and that is uh give you a chance to maybe give the spotlight to anyone any kind of creator any other filmmaker anyone doing anything that you just feel like um, doesn't really get the uh, attention maybe they deserve or you just want to like uh, have people check out their work or yeah. anything like this or anyone that comes to mind that um, you'd like to highlight I suppose I would say and I think about because I, I talked about it a little bit earlier on was um, we used a song I in the in the movie uh, by um, it's called now you know by little Willie John mm. And I had seen his, uh, it's a lovely song, and I think it, it, it plays great in the film. He feels like a little bit of a, of a lost artist. Mm. Uh, I had discovered him when I watched um, The Blue Rune by J Jeremy Sawyer. Yeah. And they used No Regrets, which is a, lo a lovely song. They used that in that movie. Um, that's all of that. Mm -hmm. I would say m people should listen to more Little Willie John, yeah. uh, watch more Jeremy Solnier's movies, and Macon Blair, who starred in this. He's a great filmmaker and a great actor as well. Um, there's Tree Straight Away that I think should be getting a lot more uh, attention. Cool. Yeah, it's always it's always fun to like just share the things you're passionate mm. about. Or like, oh, this this artist is fantastic. Please check it out. So mm. we always like to give people an opportunity to do that. So thank you. Uh, well, before we wrap it up, is there anything else you'd like to say about the film uh, before we finish? I um, mean, we it screens tonight, mm -hmm. so um, in a couple hours, I'm very curious to see how it'll play play with the crowd here. Um, uh, I heard that there's there's a good cr there, there's a we've got good, good uh, a, a good a good audience coming yeah. to tonight so that that's that's great yeah and then it comes out on the 19th in the US so again I'm just you know hope yeah. it finds an audience like every filmmaker when they make something yeah and that's um, and that it's enjoyed you know yeah I truly enjoyed it I I mentioned off camera too I'll go ahead and give a shout out to my brother Austin he had recommended your first film to me so I was really excited when I was announced that I was going to get a chance to speak with you so I texted him first I was like you know thank you for the recommendation now I get to uh get to speak with him so well yeah thank you so much for joining me everyone oddity is going to be a horror film that I highly recommend for this year it's a really good one it's got a lot of fun surprises I think it builds off your previous work really well and um, I got to see it a few times and so I enjoyed it every time so thank you for bringing some good some good horror for 2024 thank you excellent thanks Justin <laughs> thanks for being with me Damien have a good one thank you